In Obsidian, the series project's consciousness is represented by a single entity, the Conductor. But that's just an interface. In reality, the intelligence of a complex machine is likely to be distributed. A distributed intelligence is one in which the whole functions only through the sum of its parts. An anthill, a network of traffic, and a body full of cells are the examples preferred to in Obsidian's Church of the Machine. In The Society of Mind, Marvin Minsky explores this notion. What magical trick makes us intelligent? The trick is that there is no trick. The power of intelligence stems from our vast diversity, not from any single perfect principle. Our species has involved many effective, although imperfect, methods, and each of us individually develops more on our own. Eventually, very few of our actions and decisions come to depend on any single mechanism. Instead, they emerge from conflicts and negotiations among societies of processes that constantly challenge one another. Alright, Bismuth. We had our fun in games in the piazza, but we have work to do. We have things missing in here in order to get up to that frame. Especially since it just won't let us there. Hmm. Human pilot has started takeoff sequence. Reflight check commencing. Please flip switch D1. Please flip switch B2. 6 beeps again. Flip switch A3. Pre-flight check complete. Plane prepared for regulation of flight. Human pilot, please select destination. Two locations now. Pilot has selected the Church of the Machine. Selection is a regulation destination. Plane prepared for regulation flight. Commencing departure. I do like that whenever we're flying from place to place, they do program it so that we kind of return to the junkyard before going to a new destination. It just makes the traveling on a technical level very clean. Sorry, I'm still a bit rough. You okay, Bismuth? Yep, you're okay. Well, welcome to the Church of the Machine. Quite the place. So quite the imagery. If we were able to see the full thing from here, it's three figures passing on to a central object. Lots of figures standing around. Well now at least Bismuth's reading a book. I would say it's his Bible, but it looks a little unfinished. Something that is blank that will have information placed on it, based on going to three places with a bottom section that doesn't make much sense right now. Well, if you're gonna be up here, Bismuth, I'm gonna take a look around down there. See you in a bit. Can we 
I get a bet? Yeah, there we go. Much better look. Yep, those three figures. Sprawling towers. Just a whole lot of different things. And in the center, well, we'll get a better look at what's in the center, but right now I want to go out to the outsides. Three different spaces that we're able to take a look at. At the end are altars of some sort. Not much difference between the three, just slightly different. All of them have a connection to something. But in the middle, but in the middle, something very, very uncomfortably familiar. I'm gonna go away for right now. We'll be back later. There's one other place we can go down here, though. There's the three branches that were in Bismuth's book, but there is this one other place, that bottom section. Not so much a hallway that makes four areas, but more like four statues that we're able to see. Unfortunately, when you look at them in-game, you're not able to get a good idea of what they actually look like facing the front. It's only in the strategy guide where you get a good concept of what the robot angels look like. And they look really cool. So, what do we plan to do here? Well, we must face our new fear. Braving the belly of the beast. Yes, yes we do. Have to do something about this chip right in front of us. It's really big. In order to do something about it, we must head inside here for our next puzzle. Okay, hey, hope you're comfy, hope you're ready to take notes, because now we're going to discuss this puzzle, which is arguably one of my favorite puzzles ever. It is a fantastic puzzle. Before we start anything, we need to understand what is actually happening here. So the goal of this puzzle is to get the chip that we have in front of us embossed by the three different altars that we have to go through. The reason that this is difficult is that there is not enough instructions down below in the spider's program in order to make that happen. No matter what program you try, the spider will either 1. crash, or 2. run out of moves. When that happens, it always returns to the main altar and we need to try again. So let's take a look at what we're dealing with here. First, on the bottom of the screen there are 10 markers. They relate to the 10 steps in one cycle of the spider's program. There is another one at the beginning, this symbolizing holding up the chip to be blessed, but this one remains constant and cannot be changed. So we have a total of 11. Next is the reader, which is the yellow triangle beneath the markers. Wherever the reader is, that is the instruction that's going to be carried out at that moment. If it reaches the end of the cycle and hasn't crashed, it will return to the beginning of the cycle and continue reading. Now here's the thing with the cycle. If the spider is standing in the front of the main altar by the end of the cycle, then the chip is blessed again and the program can continue. If the spider is not standing in front of the main altar, the chip cannot be blessed and the spider crashes. There is also the top-down map of the entire area, covering all the locations that the spider can visit. And in addition, in the top right corner, there is the four square programming grid. Each square performs a different function on our markers that is different from the others. By playing around with the programming grid and the markers, you learn that the markers have four different positions that you can set them in. 
four different instructions. Go forward, turn right and go forward, turn left and go forward, and turn around 180 degrees and go forward. All four instructions go forward one space. There is also the four functions of the programming grid. Starting at the top left, we have the triangle which moves the editor forward one step, or one marker. The bottom left, showing the up arrow, changes the marker's instruction forward one position. The down arrow on the top right moves it backward one position. And the bottom right square with the four triangles, looking like it goes in fast forward, moves the editor four positions forward. And if it reaches the last marker and hasn't had four markers to move to, it will continue at the beginning of the markers until it finishes. So together let's do another test run. This time we're going to program the spider so that it will visit the robot angels which are on the bottom of our map. We're going to make them walk around to each one in a loop and complete its circuit with a second visit to the first angel and then come back to the main altar. So it's going to look something like this. It's going to turn around 180 degrees and go forward, then go forward, then turn left, go forward, left, go forward, left, go forward, and right, go forward. We've only programmed six of our ten steps here, but for now we're just going to leave the remaining four steps programmed to go forward as is. Let's see how this works. So the program doesn't work. Okay. You might have noticed as the spider arrives at each angel, something happened to the spider's program. Each angel changes it differently. In fact, if we look at our map again, you notice that each of the four symbols on our programming grid are also down there as well, which means that each angel changes the spider's programming on the fly if we meet with it. So here was our problem with our test run here. By the time we were at the fourth angel and ready to proceed to the fifth, the fifth instruction had been moved backward once by the editor. So instead of proceeding to the main altar, the spider turned around and went back to the fourth angel. Then, because the sixth command was said to move forward, and that was an impossible move, the spider crashed. So let's try another test run here. This time we're just going to change the fifth instruction to go forward and leave everything else the same as in our earlier trial. It worked that time. The spider does get back to the main altar. But why? The reason is, is because we anticipated that the fourth angel would move the fifth instruction back one. You counteracted it by setting that fifth instruction one step past the one you really wanted. When the instruction changed, bingo. There was the correct choice. So here's what we've learned. Here's our aha moment. The fact that we can alter the program on the fly or self-modify it is the way in order to solve what we need to do here. 
But now our big problem is how can we make a self-modifying program that works for this puzzle? We know we must use the angels in order to change our program, because otherwise we don't have enough room in order to get to all three altars, but we don't want the path through the angels to change, we do want the path to the side altars to change. So here's an idea. What if you were to program the spider to go to a side altar in the first five steps, and then go through the angels in the last five steps? If we think about it, traveling to each of the side altars is very similar to one another. All three of them are straight lines. If we think about it then, the only instructions that we need to change would be the first instruction, which sets the spider in its altar direction, and instruction five, which sends the spider to the angels. These two steps need to keep changing because the orientation of the spider keeps changing. Steps two, three, and four never have to change at all because, again, we're dealing with a straight line. If we modify the code so that the spider completes a cycle, and it begins again with those two edited instructions, then the whole program might be able to proceed to completion. Here's one more piece of information. At the end of a cycle, both the reader and the editor return to the first marker. This means that during a long run of cycles, the code can self-modify the same two instructions continuously. So instead of thinking about the program as just one long part, split them into two parts. The first five take the spider to a side altar and return to the main altar. The second five take it to the robot angels, modify instructions one and five in the process, and then return to the main altar. With this way of thinking, the second half of the program will remain constant, and the first half will be continuously changed by the second half. Now the next question we have to think about really quickly is which altar do we start with? Because that is going to be important too with our code. If you've done some practice on your own, you'll come to the conclusion that the only way that we're able to start this program is with the spider heading to the altar in the 9 o'clock position, if we were thinking in a shape of a clock, and then moving clockwise around. The very last thing to consider in the program is to make sure that once the spider has visited the last altar, it does need to set the chip down at the main altar so that everything is nicely wrapped up at the very end. If you're not sure about the programming, here is what the programming looks like. From left to right, you have a left forward, forward, turn around forward, forward, right forward, forward, left forward, left forward, left forward, and finally right forward. The movies on each of the side altars represent some form of distributed intelligence. Distributed intelligence is a concept related to nanotechnology. It refers to systems in which the sum of a system's parts displays a purposeful organization, while each part seems only to know about its own particular function. This is the opposite of a centralized intelligence, such as the human brain. One of the movies is of an anthill. An anthill is a perfect example of distributed intelligence, because there are a million ants doing lots of things at once, but there is no single ant that is directing the flow of activity. Another movie is of a cell dividing. In any complex living organism, the cells all seem to understand their own roles completely, just like an ant, but demonstrate no ability to glean the big picture.
third movie is of cars moving along city streets at night. This example is slightly more poetic than the others. As a child, did you ever step back from the flow of bright lights on a freeway and think, to some outside entity, wouldn't this appear to be one giant living thing? Wouldn't the cars all seem like cells, in a way, carrying specific items throughout the system according to some great and unseen plan? So we're done. As everything was just kind of getting going and the music was going faster and faster and faster, it feels like I've just stumbled out of everything. And so, we have a much smaller chip as our reward for finishing this puzzle. What can we do with that chip? We'll figure out a place to put it once we leave this place. Alright, Bismuth, it's time to go. We have one other place to be.